It's great to be here tonight. Appreciate everybody for driving to be here. And some have driven uh, a long way, rather than from Wichita Falls. It's always great to see uh, people that I love very much and work with here in this assembly. Great to see Brother Johnny Elmore, Brother Ted Warwick, preachers of the gospel, uh, here tonight. We're going to get right to it. Separation and distinction from the world is maybe the most uh, difficult concept that Scripture talks about. Whenever people, whenever people are saved from their sins based off their surrender to the gospel and obedience, the Bible teaches that we are saved. We are saved from all of our sins that we have ever committed, that little old me has been able to amass, wash, and made clean, the Bible says. We have full confidence in that. The Bible also says that evil communications will corrupt good morals. So what I learned from that is, even though the church is and the king, as the kingdom of God is partway in heaven and partway on this earth as the church, there is a dramatic there is a dramatic drawing power away from God. It is almost uh, gravitational, but certainly it is powerful in how Satan gets us to really adopt the practices and the lifestyle of the world as it relates to every area of our life. And I want to talk about one of those areas that doesn't get talked about a lot. I want to talk about work. Work is one of those incredible things that we don't recognize. We spend more, pe more time with people at work than anywhere else. I want to tell you a little story before I get started. The light turned yellow just in front of him. He did the right thing and he stopped at the crosswalk. Even though he could have he could have beaten the light by accelerating through the intersection. The lady that was tailgating him was obviously in a bad hurry. She was furious. She was honking her horn, screaming. She was absolutely saying everything under the sun at missing her chance to get through the intersection, not to mention the fact she dropped her cell phone and makeup in the floorboard. About that moment of mid rant she heard a police officer tap on her window. He was not happy. He... Uh, took her from the vehicle, arrested her, put her in the car, took her to jail, and finally she was escorted back to the booking desk with all of her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for this mistake, ma'am. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, making awful gestures at the man in front of you. I could hear some of the awful things that you were saying, and I noticed what would Jesus do as a bumper sticker and the choose life license plate holder and the follow me to my church bumper sticker and the chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk so naturally, I assume you had stolen the car. If you were to be on trial at your job, would they be able to convict you of being a Christian? If you were not only just an employee, but the boss. If you're the man with the pen, or you're the man that follows the directions of the man or woman who holds the pen, what kind of experience are the people having around you? I can tell you this, in the book of Acts, the Bible says... That there were people that were persecuted, saved disciples of Jesus Christ. And the, the thing that was told about them is the Bible says people took note that they had been with Jesus. Why? How do you know the difference between people that have been with Jesus and people that don't know him at all? And the answer is the reaction that other people get in other circumstances when normal people would just go nuts. You see, when you become a Christian, there are a lot of decisions and a lot of things that are already made, but it's still a choice and it's still difficult. The Bible teaches in 2 Corinthians 6, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And he said, I dwell in them and will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Whenever you left for school as a kid, what did your mom and dad say? I can tell you what mine said. He gave the life law lesson that did not have any details. Dad was not into details. His answer was that he got from Lincoln County, Mississippi was, you ought to have been born with enough sense to know how to act. So he would just simply say, behave yourself. The point of that is this. I was his son, three of us as boys, and we knew that there were expectations based on our relationship. 
relationship with him, which I might add, Johnny will tell you there's a row of cedar trees by our house that we believe the devil put there because daddy used those as switches on us. And there was an expectation as we were in school of don't do these things or you're going to get in trouble and whatever you get at school, you're going to get worse at home. And that was absolutely true. But as I got older, there was a difference and a distinction in the kind of relationship that I had with my father. And when I was little, it was all about in first, fourth, let's see, fourth grade. I'm going to confess my faults to you, young people. I, I was voted least likely to spiritually succeed in my family. I'm just telling you right now. Uh, you can turn it around. But when I was in fourth grade, I took Chad Bramer's, actually I took one of my brother, Ch Chad, his hat pins from his hat, and I stuck it in Chad Bramer's chair. And Chad Bramer was the, the son of a local Baptist preacher, and Chad sat down on that tack, and he screamed and cried, and I got a paddling for it. And I begged Mr. Claiborne, please don't tell my dad. Don't tell my dad. Because I knew that when he found out, it was going to be bad at home. But over time, when I got older in high school, I began to make decisions based off the teachings that my parents had taught me. And I don't want and did not want to disappoint them. Now, is that always going to happen? No, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is the book of general truths. It also says, a soft answer turns away wrath. I promise you, I sell that chicken for KFC. I have seen some of my staff get cussed out over a biscuit. I'm not kidding. A soft answer does not always turn away wrath. You can do the best job in the world, and your kid still has the choice to make up their own mind. What God is basically saying here, let me be your father. Act in such a way, be distinct so that people know you're my child. Don't act like you're a child of the world. Do not drink at those tables. Do not eat at those tables. Do not have fellowship. And don't go into business with those people. You are in this world. You are not of this world. And there is a drastic difference in those things. Jesus said in John 17, 15 to the Father, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So we have to be distinct at work. In Genesis 2.15, the Bible says the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. The curse of Genesis 3.17 and the reason why so many people in this room had to sweat today to make a living goes like this. Then to Adam he said, because you heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth, and you shall eat of the herb of the, of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Sin caused work to be difficult. It caused it to be painful. It caused it to be and caused the sweat of our brow. Work is a major time allocation. In Mark 6 and verse 3, Jesus pronounces, or they announce in Mark 6 verse 3, that Jesus was a carpenter. He was a carpenter. And among the ancient Jews, every father was bound to do four things for his son. Circumcise him on the eighth day. That was a part of the covenant that God made a long time ago. To redeem him according to the law or the Torah. Number three, to teach him the law. Jesus at age 12 exemplified that by asking and answering questions. Do you know the thing that troubles me more than anything else? God is so little discussed in our homes many times that our children would have no time to, to ask questions about God because he simply is not a topic except that it's brought up three times a week. That won't work. Jesus was somebody that lived in a home where God was honored and revered. How many times do you think it was that the family of Jesus Christ heard the story where the angel had spoken to Mary and also to Joseph? How many times do you think they recognized that there was something special about their family and the law of God was read? Jesus exemplified that. Number four, you had to teach a boy a trade. I don't know about you, but this, this old phrase, the man who does not teach his son a trade has trained him to steal. If kids cannot do anything except play video games and play ball, we're in serious trouble. I'm going to say that again. If kids cannot do anything except play ball and video games, we're in bad trouble. I get kids at work sometimes, they get really confused. And I want to tell you about school, even today, and it's, it's getting a lot better, I think. 
But even today, you can go in and never crack a book, and if you've got above average intelligence, you can make a C with no problem. Don't tell your kids that kids don't listen to that part. You've got to study. You've got to apply yourself. All you prove in that moment is you're able to memorize and regurgitate facts for the most part. A whole lot of those facts, you, you, even though your, your brain is expanding, you're able to process more and more volume of facts. The reality is you're not going to retain everything about it. So we, we try to get that and we try, we try, we try. Most seniors that are going to Harvard could not pass the eighth grade test that Abraham Lincoln took in Illinois. That's just a fact. Go look it up sometime if you want to Google it. Interesting reading. So you have kids come in. They reach the 26-year-old mark. According to our government, you can stay on your parents' insurance until you're 26. That's great. So we got this moment where a quarter century has gone by and a kid has never hit a lick of snake in their life. They've never had a job. And every young person, you listen to me right now, I don't care if you're a boy, I don't care if you're a girl, it's your job to learn how to work and to look forward to work. You've got to do those things. Now, I'm not saying you're going to have easy jobs, and I'm not going to say every job is going to be pleasant all the time, but I am going to tell you that God expects you to do your best all the time. And that's going to be one of the clearest distinctions as we move through this lesson between a Christian and somebody that is not a Christian. God calls us to be distinct, and He calls us to work. God promised our needs would be met if we seek first the kingdom of God in Matthew 6, 33. God, God, remember this, God gives the birds their food, but He doesn't throw it into their nests. Think about this. The men God called were usually busy. Name the last time you've seen someone win someone else to Christ that was lazy. It takes work and effort to do that. Well, God used people that were busy people, fishermen and tax collectors, Doctors, businessmen, men of every walk from life. And, and you know, there were a lot of them that Jesus said something that was very unique many times. He would say on one occasion, if any man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not worthy of the kingdom. He would describe people that would come to him and begin to make excuse for the kind of work that they should be doing in the kingdom. One of which was, hey, I took a wife. Can I take a leave? Or I got to bury somebody. And the Lord gave seemingly very harsh wording for that. The reason he did that is because it's so important that you recognize God has some business that has to be taken care of in your life. And he's not against you attending a funeral or getting married. What he is against is putting anything in the way of him being first placed. Because if you do that, you rob yourself and you destroy your relationship with God because he is a God that does not take second place. First of all, it's not good for us. But secondly, he's not going to have it. It's just not going to work. There's a young guy I know one time um, that uh, came over and we were studying together and, and he did not have a job. And uh, it was one of those things of, it's just one of those deals, man. i, I got to tell you, it's one of the most uncomfortable conversations. And if you're in this crowd and, and, and you feel like I'm throwing a rock at you, I don't know you from Adam Zolfox as far as what's going on in your life. But I want to tell you, if, if, if you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that got hit. I'm not doing this to, to make guilt in anybody's heart, but I am saying this. God requires people to work. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, here's what the Bible says. If anyone does not provide for his own, he, and especially for those of his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That's an unbeliever. So this young guy... It finally gets bad, and I can tell what's going on, and he's just not getting a job. You know, let me tell you something. If you go into 50 interviews, and you've got your junk straight, and you've got something to offer, in this day and age, you can find a job. You can find a job. And so I kind of had that, it was a very nice conversation. I said, look, you've got to stop, I say it's nice, I said you've got to stop draining your parents. You've got to get a job. You have to work. And I read that verse too. I got a phone call from his dad that night. He was very mad at me. His dad said, did you call my son an infidel? After I realized what, that was how he answered the phone. I said, after I realized what was going on with the deal, I said, no. I didn't call your son an infidel. But the Holy Spirit said that your baby boy is worse than an infidel. That's what the Bible says. 
Don't mistake me tonight. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to not have a job. I'm saying it makes somebody worse than an infidel. Now, is that a part of my Christian duty? You bet it is. You've got to get up and hit a lick at something every day. You've got to get up and produce. Now, there are people that are disabled. I am not talking about that. There are people that legitimately, for whatever reason it is, cannot do whatever work needs to be done. I'm not talking about that. Please know that. But I am talking about a society today that doesn't recognize how money is made and they do not recognize their responsibility to get up and provide for not only themselves but others. That passage doesn't just say do whatever you want to do with your money. That passage says provide for those for yourself and those of your household. You have a responsibility to your family. That's a pretty big deal. Not just a pretty big deal. It's a massive deal. So what do we need to teach our little boys and little girls? you got to get up and go do your best every day. You've got to get a job and you've got to work and you've got to do chores. You've got to do some stuff. You want to know why the greatest generation was called the greatest generation? It's because they got up before daylight. They worked and milked cows and cut hay and did all kinds of stuff. Planted ridiculously large gardens because that's the only way they could make it. And after they did that... A lot of those people in our nation went off to war and everything else, but when they came home, they produced. We got an ism and an out for everybody and their dog how not to do work. And it's not okay. God said, you gotta work. That's a major, major deal. Paul said in, in Acts 18, verse 3, that he was a tent maker. He was that because he wanted to be a good example of a hardworking preacher. The only reason he did that, listen to me, is because there were immature preachers that did not have the appropriate view of the work of a preacher and also what their responsibility was. So what did he do? He would use phrases like, I did not rob Corinth and Ephesus. In 1 Thessalonians 4.11, he said that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we command you. That you walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Hardworking Christians are blessings to unbelievers. And one of the great blessings that hardworking Christians are to their outside or unbelieving neighbors is that they produce children that work hard and grandchildren that work hard. You know, listen, I want you to think about this just for a second. Whenever you go back in time... Uh, there was a guy in my family, Johnny knows him, his name was Nall. You go down the next side, and it was Grafton, and then you go to my dad, uh, Jimmy, and then there's three of us. So I'm in this list down here too. And each one of them, you start thinking about doing less. Okay? Every generation wants to make things easier for their kids and their grandkids. Tell me you don't believe that. Some of you have saved ever half of ever nickel you've ever had, and you've got the first dollar you ever made earmarked for baby boy or baby girl. Oh, I don't want him to have to work going to college. Well, bless your heart. Maybe he needs to work. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about the fact that whenever it says, oh, he's a full-time student, that's fine. And I know lots of kids that are full-time students, and if you've got a full ride, by all means keep it. I'm not belittling that. I did too. But I can tell you, you're getting ready to have the most time, free time in your life that you've ever had. You previously had your life planned from 7 o'clock to 3.30, and that's fixing to stop. And I promise you, anybody that says, oh, well, I still get up at 7 and I, I, I just work till that and come on. That's not happening. The point I'm making is this. People are given less in each generation. My dad didn't have to do as much as his dad did. I don't have to do as much as my dad did. At some point in time, this applies spiritually as well. You, don't want, to, you want to know the output problem with this scenario? This is a real problem. Because you get down here and before long, some of my kids aren't going to be worth shooting. If we start thinking about there's less to do, there's less work to do, by all means, one day we'll just have to do nothing. When you see that doesn't work. And the direct relationship between hard work here will absolutely be hard work on the spiritual side because God uses busy people, people whose calendars are all full, and I've got so much going on. So you find me hard workers, you find me people that get up and bust it every day, I'm going to find you people that are going to be soul winners. Because that's hard work. 
In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 7, Paul said, You yourselves know how you ought to follow us. But we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but work with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If any one will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. But there are those, but those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ, that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. I told you a minute ago, there are kids who don't know how to work. That's true. My Yankee brother-in-law called me one day and he said, uh, I want you to come start a restaurant with me. And so we opened a KFC Taco Bell in Julie's hometown of Farmerville, Louisiana. We'd never done that before. Shouldn't have done it then. That's one of those you wish you'd listen to your wife deals. But anyway, we did. And whenever we did that, there were a couple of hires. We hired, we had almost 2,000 applicants in a small town. It's like everybody and their dogs came out. We didn't hire but like 60 people for that opening run. And some of them were awful. Uh, there was one kid specifically, his name was Galen, he was six foot four. You don't know how many times I would sit down and interview a kid and they would walk in and say, I'm a hard worker. Oh, you are? Good. Tell me where you worked before. Well, I have never had a job before. And you're like, oh, brother. Okay, uh, what have you done? Have you volunteered anywhere? Have you cut your grandma's yard? Have you, have you, you know, do you have a chores list you can tell me about? What do you do? I don't do any of that, but I'm a hard worker. How are you a hard worker? All you proved is you can breathe and go to school. You're not a hard worker. That's not a hard worker. That's not getting anything done. You know when you can say I'm a hard worker? When you pay taxes? That's when you can say I'm a hard worker. Kids sometimes say, why can't we do what the adults don't? I'll tell you why you don't pay taxes. Kids in school love that answer. When you start thinking about these kids, I remember this Galen kid. He was great in drive through He was real nice and sweet. We all loved him. He did not know how to sweep. No, no, I'm not kidding. He didn't know how to use a room or a mop. Do you know there are people that don't know how to use a room or a mop? Do you know there are people that do not know how to clean a restroom or a bathroom? Oh, there's lots of them. You start trying to train them. Now use that broom. And, and this kid, Galen, literally grabs the broom. You know the appropriate thing is to start at the wall and work your way in little strokes. You know what he was doing with it? He was pushing that broom around the lobby like this. He couldn't figure out what to do with it. He couldn't figure out which end was the business in. He was just kind of moving around. And I looked at my brother-in-law, knowing that he was raised by Kathy Willis. And if you know his mama, Kathy Willis, she's like a neat nut of cataclysmic proportions. Ryan knows how to sweep 16,000 different ways because that's what his mama made him do. So he goes over there and he teaches Galen how to sweep. You know what Galen said? Thanks, I don't know how. Ryan said, you've never swept anything in your life. He said, no, my mama does it. You remember that, mamas. Then we get to the mopping. What do you think he did with the mop? You think he used context clues to figure it out? You think he went home and watched the YouTube video? No! He just did a real bad job. He chased that mop around the lobby too. And I couldn't wait to say, hey, Ryan, Galen's back at it again. And Ryan went like that. That was Yankee for I'm fixing to kill this kid. And I don't know what I'm going to do with him. You want to know what the problem is? Nobody ever trained Galen. You know what the problem is with a lot of Christian kids? They do not understand that it's their God-given responsibility to be the hardest workers in the world. And it's parents' and grandparents' job to teach that. And it won't get done by talking. It's going to get done by doing. You know what I figured out? There's a phrase I have to teach my, uh, my nephews that my dad used a lot. He didn't use these words, but it was the effect of slow, don't go. Everywhere we went was fast. Everywhere we did, when it had to do with work, was the fastest you could get it done. If we're loading wood, boy, you better get with it and pick it up. I always hated hearing my dad say, I'm not raising hay, I'm raising boys. But he was. He was. Now, that's just 
small realities that we have to face as Christians, but everybody has got to have a job. And all of us have got to learn how to do our very best at those jobs. And then we have to learn the balance between our work ethic and our goals. Because you know what is not okay? It's not okay to teach a boy and a girl that the only thing in life is money. Because you know the one thing that our children need from us more than anything else? It's the one thing that we have less of now than we ever have had, and it's time. Not this. Time. Time. You know the times your kids are going to be the happiest? It's not going to be when you take them to Six Flags. They'll get to go to Six Flags the rest of their life. It'll be that time where you took a family vacation and everybody threw Satan's device out. I mean a cell phone. And you just were with each other. You want to know why kids want to be around Mimi and Papa and Pappy and Granny and all the other nanny, Juju and all the other stuff that we call grandparents now? Because they get to spend time. You want to make an impact on their life? Spend time with them. Time. That's the thing that's going to make the biggest difference in the world. But we have to balance that. Because sometimes we get to thinking that making a dollar and getting ahead in life is the only thing. And so we have to set two kinds of goals. The first goal is, hey, we got to teach baby boy and baby girl how to work. And the only way that can happen is if I show them the how to work hard. But then we also have to recognize that there are some things that have to be done spiritually. And that also takes time. And that also is a work ethic in our families. And again, there is a direct relationship. Or there can be a direct relationship between those that are active and busy and, and great providers and work hard every day. And the spiritual giants that work among us. There has to be a balance. Because the Bible says we can never become covetous. According to Colossians chapter 3, verse Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, the Bible says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out of it. Having food and clothing, with all these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. If you do not become wealthy, or if you do become wealthy, here's how you stay spiritually healthy. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, the Bible says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Do you know what big rich guys do like Warren Buffett? They give their kids nothing. And every kid in the audience is thinking, don't finish what you're fixing to do because I, I, I smell the rat you found. You're right, I have. I found a big rat. Here it is. You want to ruin your family? Leave millions of dollars for them to fight over. You want people to look forward to you kicking the bucket? Leave millions of dollars for your kids to fight over. I have never, so help me, of the problems that I see in people's family, that's one of the greatest problems you will ever face. Don't curse your children. I'm not saying you can't give your kids and your grandkids gifts. There's things that won't ruin their life, but when you leave people life-changing amounts of money, trust me, it doesn't end well. Because God intended on your kids getting up every day and working hard and making a living and learning how to be content and be godly at the same time. And the people that want to be rich that the Bible talks about here, you show me those people and I'll show you heartache after heartache after heartache. I can show you a doctor that I went to church with that spent every last dime of his wife's inheritance and borrowed against land that she had. Got to be a medical doctor and figured out that wasn't very much fun. He wasn't having any fun, so he wasted everything they had. Went bankrupt a couple of times. You talk about not fun. You know what the problem is? He didn't understand he had to still work hard. He thought the title doctor would just fix everything. 
You want to know what you should do? You should still work hard. And if you make lots of money, you know what you should do with that money? You should give a whole lot of it away. You should give it a whole lot of it away to spiritual things. Not to hang your name somewhere on a building, but to get people soul saved. Did you know that? You know the more money you give to the work and the work of the church, the more the church is going to be able to do to send people around and preach the gospel all over this world? You know we've got new churches right now springing up in various places, far-flung places. A place like Maine or a place like Egypt. There's all kinds of places right now that the gospel is being accepted. And although we may, may never see it, I can promise you this. Don't, don't ever die thinking about the misery that you're going to cause your kids by leaving them millionaires. That ain't going to work well. In fact, it's going to curse them. Don't do that. You see, I want to tell you something else. I'd hate to meet the Lord with lots and lots of money. I don't care if you're an individual or a church. What are you going to do? Give it back to the Lord like some kind of a birthday present? You think He's going to be happy with that? The Bible says we lay up treasure in heaven. You tell me what you're investing in. I know people that have IRAs and they've got Roth and they've got traditional and they've got all kinds. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't retire and have enough money to have an income. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm saying is this. There comes a time in your life where you have to start picking and choosing what you're going to invest in. And it better be spiritual things and it better be the Lord. In fact, it's got to be. God's call to work doesn't mean every job. I'm going to roll through this pretty quick. Jobs that require you to uncover your body for work cannot be performed by Christians according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9-11, through 11, among other passages. The Bible, the Bible teaches that jobs that require you to lie to people or for people, Colossians 3, verse 9. I've got a friend of mine right now. Works for a big old company. He wasn't there the day that somebody lied and, and if things happened, bottom line, he's an engineer at a big energy company. He told people exactly what to do. They did the wrong thing. They didn't ask. It put their lives in jeopardy. And instead of holding them accountable, he was held accountable. So they brought him in and said, we want you to sign this piece of paper. The piece of paper was a lie. You can sign it and keep your job. Or you can not sign it and probably won't keep your job. So he was real upset about it. In fact, I've prayed with him many, many times about this. He was so upset. And finally I asked him one day, I said, well... Would you tell a lie to keep your job? He said, never. I said, then you can't sign a lie to keep your job. He didn't sign it. You want to know something about that guy? He was such a hard worker. They just docked his bonus, made him mad, and then came around on the backside of it and gave him a raise to make up for it. Isn't that a peach? Why do you think that is? Because he went in there with Scripture. Literally, we, I armed him with the teeth with Scripture. And he says, I would never tell you a lie according to the Bible. And I'm not going to sign a lie by the Bible. And that threat just went away. He didn't lose his job. He didn't lose his job at all. But maybe you will. Jobs that require you to steal for yourself or others, Ephesians 4.29. Jobs that require you to miss the Lord's Day on Sunday morning need to be changed. The Bible says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, or he who, faith, who is promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. I think about this. I think about all the ways that jerk bosses and people try to influence us in the world to put us in positions to give up our relationship with God in various ways. It's just about the time that somebody gets really energized and really excited about what it means to be a Christian that some jerk boss puts it on the line and says, you're going to lose your job if you're not here Sunday morning. And you begin that process of switching out and trading and switching out and trading until finally one day there's just nobody to switch and trade. You see how Satan works? Here's what I'm going to tell you. I get it that some th sometimes <clears throat> people's ox gets in the ditch and they're sick and they're out and whatever else. But there's a big difference in our world today in the kind of decisions that I believe the Lord expects us to make that go like this. People are putting me in a position to have to choose between my relationship with God as it comes to this supper and this memorial or providing for my family. Listen to me carefully on this. This is where your faith gets down to the nitty-gritty and the brass tacks. 
The Bible says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What I'm telling you is this. I've known of about a half a dozen people in my lifetime that have had that moment where they pushed it to that moment and they said, Look, i got to be somewhere at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'll come in early. I'll go to worship, and i got to be there. You want me to be there. I'll come back after services, and I'll work. I'll work extra and over, but I need somebody to cover me for two hours. Maybe that's happened to you. It's happened to me before. There are some decisions that I want you to think about already being made. And I don't want it to get you to be an emotional, stressed out wreck and feel like God's somehow letting you down by putting you in this situation. It's not God. It's the devil. You see, he wants you to put this on the line and say, what are you willing to trade it for? What are you going to trade it for? This memorial right here is to show forth the death of the world. I want to tell you this. Jason Kuhn gave a great sermon at the 4th of July meeting about this. Jason, if you don't know him, is going to make a great preacher. He's been going to make a great preacher since he was about eight years old and wore a suit and tied a church. He's made it his business to be a preacher. But you know, he wouldn't be a preacher and probably we'd never know his name if his mama wasn't converted. And you want to know how she was converted? Because there were some people that she saw that went on a band trip and they would not miss church. Their faith, they would not miss church. And that was so compelling to her that whenever she got straight and tried to look, look up God and tried to get close to God, guess who she went to see? She went to see those couple of kids that wouldn't miss Lord's Day for a band trip. You think she'd ever gone to those same people and asked them about their faith if this wasn't the very first priority in their life? No! That was his point. Don't you ever underestimate the little choices and the decisions you have to make. You need prayer or you need help finding a job. Listen, there's a room full of people here. We can find you a job. I didn't finish telling you, of those half dozen people that I mentioned just a minute ago, most of the time, in fact all the time in all those cases, they found better jobs than they had before with higher wages and better deals. God's good. God's not asking you not to feed your family. But God is asking you to show forth the most precious gift that God ever sent every Lord's Day morning, and it's the death of Jesus Christ, because that's what we do around this table. And work doesn't ever need to get in the way of that. In fact, everybody we know in all of our life, one of the greatest things they will ever be able to say about us is, I know where they're going to be on Sunday morning. You want to rob them? Do it between 10 and 12 on Sunday. Do people know that about us? Do people think about that when they think of us? God calls us to be distinct employees. Ephesians 6 and 5 bears out this reality. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity, as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. Does that mean you should work hard for your boss because you're not really working hard for your boss that's a jerk? That's right. If you've never had a jerk boss, you will. And it's fun. I want to tell you a couple of reasons why somebody can be a jerk to you. First of all, they're very put off by the fact that they can't get you to act like them. And they cannot understand why you would still work hard and do a good job when they're not treating you right. And I want you to think about that because sometimes people are testing your Christianity, whether it's a teacher or a boss or whatever. You know, there's jerk teachers too. There are. There are people that don't like kids that teach school. I've never understood that, but it's the truth. I literally will go to school uh, here in just a few days and we'll run into some teachers that say, we've got 187 days to go, ladies. Well, put my kid in her class. Right? That's not the kind of attitude we ought to have. There's going to be some nasty, dirty, filthy, stinking jobs that got to be done. You know whose hand ought to be in the air for those dirty, stinking jobs? Christians' hands ought to be in the air for those. We ought to be willing to go and do and be spent and work hard. Because we're working for the Lord. 
Colossians 3.22 bears out the same reality. Verses 22 through 25, the Bible says, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fear in God. Christians are distinct, incredible people. Do you know this, though? The amount of money stolen every year from U.S. businesses is $50 billion. That's right. $50 billion. You know the real problem? The real problem is not the things that are taken. Uh, I figured out that there's a whole lot of ways that dead chicken can walk out the door. You can cook it, you can grill it, or you can just take it raw, but it'll go out the door. Somebody, somebody just wants to take it and they'll take it, and I've seen it. But think about this. Of all the things, the FBI and the Chamber of Commerce estimates that 75% of employees still in the workplace in time $400 billion is lost in productivity every year from employees that are loafing on the job. I went to Target, my wife's favorite place, and there was a girl that had a drawer underneath her register. You know, you don't have a cell phone out. Most supervisors, they watch. She had a drawer out, and in that drawer, she had her cell phone. She had nails that long. I don't know how she texted, but buddy, she was giving it. What for? Do that. And, and that's when she would push the drawer shut and just be nice as pie. And before long, she would open that drawer and go back to whatever she was doing. You ever see that kind of stuff? It's real bad. It's one of those things that Christians have to be careful about. The Bible says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. In Titus 2 and 9, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. You adorn the doctrine by the attitude. Things like this. Surfing the internet at work. Texting at work. And smoke breaks. Oh, I hate those. Long lunch breaks and long breaks and showing up late and leaving early on salary positions and doing anything other than working. Those are things that cannot happen as Christians. It reflects on our Master who is Jesus Christ. The one thing that people ought to say about us is if you want to get something done, you go ask her. You go ask Him. You want somebody that's going to do a good job, you go ask her. You go ask Him. Those are the kind of things that people ought to be saying about Christians. And God calls us to be a distinct employer. God honors diligence and fairness. He hates the exploitation of people and will judge with severity those who do exploit others. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 24, 14, You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or of one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates. Each day you shall give him his wages, and let not the sun go down on it, for he is poor and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord, and it be a sin unto thee. Here's what James said. James said in James 5 and verse 1, Now you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, you have kept back by fraud. Cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened yourselves, your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just, and on and on. God doesn't take kindly. Here's the point. Somebody works for you, pay them. If they do work for you, you pay them. And if you don't pay them, it's a sin. And the one thing that cannot happen in the church is for anybody's reputation in this assembly to be that they don't pay their bills. It is a black mark. It is a smutty black mark upon the church. It cannot happen. Are there times where you can't pay? I get that. There are times beyond your control where bad things happen. I totally get that. You know what you do? You go and tell those people that you owe, I'm trying, and you bring them everything you can. And you go see the guy that you owe everything to, and you say, listen, I'm doing everything I can. It takes this much for my family to eat. And you have a spreadsheet with every dollar you take in. And you, you show exactly what you're doing. You know what all those people are going to do? I appreciate you. I'm going to pray for you. I'll help you. I'll do all I can for you. I'm going to be lenient with you. 
Christians can't have that reputation of not paying their debts. We've got to do everything we can to pay. And Pharaoh's decision to disrespect God and the religion of the Jews led him to find horrible circumstances of brick-making quotas without the normal amount of needed straw. He put his whips upon the back of the Israelites and made their job impossible. Don't ever make somebody's job impossible. As a Christian, people ought to want to work for you because you're the fairest and the kindest and the best person they know. You'll do everything possible to get them hours. You'll do everything possible to help them solve problems. You'll do everything possible to make them successful. But then again, last of all, it bleeds over to the spiritual. Paul told the Corinthian church this. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's never in vain. Physically, it's not in vain. Spiritually, it is not in vain. Revelation 14, 13 says, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter, in Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9, it says that we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what it says. And we understand that very plainly. The Bible teaches this faith that we're going to have is required. Repentance, according to that faith, is required. Confession, required. Baptism, required. All of that, all of that, is what it meant to be saved by grace through faith. We know that because the Apostle Paul stated in Romans 6, 3, and 4 that we don't continue in sin that grace may abound because we're dead to it. And then he identified the death, burial, and the resurrection is something we are baptized into and arise to walk in newness of life. But then he says, you were created in Christ Jesus for good works. What's the key word there? Good Good works. The Bible says in Matthew 5, you let your light so shine before men that when they see your good works, they will glorify the Father. Now, the key thing that happens a lot of times is what are you doing it for? What are you living your life for? You don't know what it means to finally live your life in freedom? You hear people talk about freedom in Christ and I want my freedom? Listen. You're going to be free one day when you cut yourself loose from all the world's expectations and you come to Jesus like He asked you to when He said, Come to me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. You work for the Lord. You'll have the greatest master in all of the world. Make no mistake about it. We're either working for the Lord or we're working for the other master, and that's the devil. No man can serve two masters. He's going to hold to the one and hate the other. He's going to love one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You know who the God of this world twists up more people with? Money. Money. What God wants you to do is keep job and work and money in its proper place. And seek first the kingdom of God because your purpose in life is not to be kum la di da in high school. Your purpose in life is to do your best. Your purpose in life is not to be uh, in Harvard and get everything known to man and go to school for 12 years and get every known doctorate you can imagine. That's not the goal of it all. You know the real goal of it all is for you to be able to work and provide for your family and have a purpose to have good works in your life to, gl to glorify God and honor God. That's your purpose. Isaiah said our, our very purpose in life is to bring glory to God. And when you're not living for yourself, it's the greatest freedom you'll ever know. We have the privilege to work for Almighty God, even the simplest tasks that we do every day. I ask you, are you a Christian at work? Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian at all. You want to be baptized for the remission of your sins. The Lord calls you to such with the gospel according to Romans chapter 10. And whenever you learn the gospel, you learn that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And if you believe that today, you're a fit candidate to make a very difficult decision. Are you willing to change your life? The Bible said in Acts 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Certainly anyone that 
believes in Jesus and is willing to change their life and be baptized in water in full surrender to the plan of salvation would get in front of this audience or before one other person at least and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and live out that profession in your life all the days of your life. Are you willing to do that? We sing a song sometimes, all to Jesus I surrender for a reason. That's what we're calling you to. While we stand and while we sing.